Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, 2018 Elite Engineers webinar. Uh, my name is Hope, and I'm a consultant from Midas. Uh, today, I am a broadcaster of this webinar session. Uh, to give brief overview, this webinar is about complex bridge load rating, which has three different webinar sessions. Um, today is the third and the last webinar, and it will be focused on uh, rating of steel bridges. So if you currently work on or have upcoming steel load rating projects, then uh, please listen to Frank and Daniel today to learn their strategies and techniques. Um, before we get into the topic, I would like to introduce our speakers and uh, show how to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, Frank and Daniel are the engineers who will share their techniques and experiences today. Um, they are both from Michael Baker International, one of the biggest engineering consulting firm. Uh, Frank is vice president and technical director for Michael Baker, and Daniel is bridge department manager. Um, they are experts in bridge engineering and have years of experiences with uh, various projects, as you may expect from their position titles. Um, I will leave them for, uh, for further information about themselves. And let me briefly explain how audiences can ask questions during the presentation. To ask questions, uh, like you can see here, there is a question tab on the control panel. First, please open the question tab. A second, please write your questions down here in the empty space. Third, please send the questions. The other way to send me a question is you can simply use the chat function. Um, when you see the picture on the right side, you will see this, when, uh, this window when you open the chat function tab. Um, Please select send question to staff. Um, then, uh, and yeah, then then your question will be shared with Frank, Daniel, and me. I will gather all the questions and share them at the end. So at the end of the presentation, so um, that he, you know, uh, Daniel and Frank can answer after the presentation. Now uh, I will pass the authority to Daniel. So hope you yeah hope you guys uh, and everyone enjoy and if you have any problem please uh, use chatting function uh, I will because I will stand by here. Yep, please welcome Frank and Daniel. Appreciate the introduction. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel feel more like a I feel more like a student than an expert, but. <laughs> appreciate it. Just sort of passing on what I've been able to. Figure out here. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it clearly. Okay, terrific. Well, then, uh, well, then here we go. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate everyone who's uh, tuned in today, and uh, everyone who's tuned in for all three sessions as well. Uh, it's a, a lot of perseverance to uh, stick it out and uh, hear hear me talk about this stuff for three webinar sessions in a row. Uh, we're on the third and uh, final session of this complex load rating webinar series, uh, uh, where today we're going to be covering steel bridges. After covering concrete bridges in the last session and a general overview of uh, load rating workflow and uh, methods in the first session. So here we go, going into uh, part three, load rating complex steel bridges. Okay, so the outline uh, for what we have, uh, Prepared for uh, for you today is uh, we'll I'll begin by talking about load rating skewed and curved girder bridges, just showing a general uh, approach and uh, an example. Uh, then Frank's going to talk about uh, rating unbraked sections, rating floor beam connections, and we'll provide a case study of the home bridge steel tied arch rating. Let's talk about load rating uh, skewed and curved steel girder bridges. Well, the overall process um, for load rating these is the same process we talked about in the, uh, the first two sessions, uh, where you start by modeling. In this case, uh, selecting the appropriate modeling method is of uh, particular importance. Uh, then go on to compute demand capacity ratios, which then lets you select the points of interest. You can then extract influence lines for those points of interest, and then uh, 
Lastly, compute the rating factors using the uh, uh, points of interest and uh, using the uh, influence lines and uh, capacities you've calculated and permanent loads for the points of interest that you'll have already calculated. Uh, so let's talk about modeling. Well, uh, the first thing to do is to see uh, whether you really need to make a 3D model. Some bridges of uh, you know, light skews or uh, light curvature can be analyzed as straight without a uh, tremendous loss of accuracy. And uh, ASHTO LRFD section 4.6.1.2.4b uh, will describe what requirements need to be met uh, to analyze a, a horizontally curved steel bridge of straight. Uh, but assuming you don't make those, meet those requirements and you do need to make a 3D model, uh, there are uh, four main types of uh, 3D models out there uh, that can be used, which I'll talk about in some detail. Um, so these types of models are a, a grillage model, uh, what I'm calling here a, a detailed grillage model, a uh, refined analysis model, and what I'm calling here a detailed refined analysis model. And uh, they each have uh, there are different functions, and I'll, I'll talk about what makes each of these different. So let's start by talking about a grillage model. So this is this is going to be uh, the most simple type of uh, model that will let you uh, analyze a grid um, in uh, 3D. So in a grillage model, basic grillage model, uh, each girder line is modeled as a single line of beam elements. So um, one element will not, uh, represent the entire uh, cross section. Uh, the cross frames are typically modeled as single beam elements as well. Uh, using a derived section properties, which represent the uh, which would represent the top cord, bottom cord, and diagonals of the cross frame in a single member, and the deck on uh, that can be modeled with shell elements, but uh, sometimes is modeled with uh, transverse beam elements as well, depending on the flavor of the grillage model. This uh, this modeling approach does have some uh, definite advantages uh, as far as 3D models go. Uh, they're relatively simple to build. Uh, working with the force results is straightforward because you'll get an output put for uh, each beam line that uh, you know is applicable for the entire cross section. And in comparison to the other modeling methods, the runtime is uh, typically fairly short. Uh, there are some disadvantages, though. It's not usually as accurate as the other modeling methods. Uh, most grillage models, uh, the beam elements in these grillage models will not have a uh, what's called a, the seventh degree of freedom or the warping torsion degree of freedom uh, that allows uh, the uh, flange lateral bending stress uh, for I sections to be computed. Uh, so then that would, would need to be approximated. And uh, then once you have the output forces for individual cross frame members, those would then uh, need to be doubt calculated using some method to obtain uh, the actual forces for the upper cord, bottom cords, and diagonals. Say if you're doing a load rating of a horizontally curved girder bridge, and those uh, cross frames are considered primary members and need to be rated as well. So that uh, a lack of a direct way to calculate flange lateral bending stress is a, a big disadvantage and uh, cross frames as well. So uh, the next flavor of these is a, a deep called a, uh, I'm calling here the detailed grillage model, where you're still modeling each girder line as a single line of beam elements, uh, but instead of having everything at the same elevation, the, uh, the deck elements and the, uh, the beam elements will be uh, offset according to their uh, relative position in the, uh, um, the cross section. Uh, in Midas, you can, you can do that using the, uh, by, by defining the, uh, the beam line you can define where the neutral axis is or where the top face of the element is with respect to the uh, entire cross section to get it to the correct uh, elevation. Uh, so in this detailed grillage model, the individual cross frames themselves are modeled, and then typically rigid links or some other rigid element will be used to join the cross frame elements at their ends to the girders in their actual location. Uh, we found this uh, um, modeling method does have some advantages over just more basic grillage uh, model um, modeling. Uh, the individual cross frame members are output, so that uh, provides the uh, you don't have to, a uh, a nice way of not having to back calculate what those forces are from the output of a single element. You can use them directly. Uh, we've seen that it does, looks like it is more accurate on the whole than basic grillage modeling. Uh, if well, elements uh, with that seventh degree of freedom uh, for warping torsion are used, you can obtain the flange lateral bending stress directly from that method, and Midas Civil does have elements which have that seventh degree of freedom, uh, so they can be used in the detailed grillage model to directly obtain those flange lateral bending stresses. Uh, there are still some disadvantages, though. Uh, 
some, some, some comparisons we've done, we don't have time to cover those today, but uh, seems to not usually be as accurate as more complex modeling. Uh, and again, if that uh, some degree of freedom is not present in the beam elements, then the uh, flange lateral bending stresses uh, need to be approximated. Uh, if that warping torsion degree of freedom is uh, in place, uh, it, it might have at least those warping torsion stresses are obtained separately from the other design forces. So uh, you would need to, uh, um, you know, typically output those separately from the uh, in-plane and uh, in-plane moments. So a little more post-processing is required. And at least from some preliminary comparisons we've done that would uh, it would be an interesting, I think, topic for a future webinar if uh, might as well have a stack. Uh, what we're seeing so far is the cross frame forces obtained uh, from a detailed village model with the seventh degree of freedom for that warping torsion uh, tend to be higher than if a uh, more refined analysis method of analysis is used, which uh, if you're trying to get the cross frames to rate out for a uh, curved girder bridge or you are designing a new straight skewed or, or curved girder bridge, that uh, those higher cross frame forces um, might, could uh, have the potential to be a problem. So the, uh, the third type of modeling uh, was typically done for uh, using curved uh, steel girder bridges, which is uh, so the next level up of complexity is uh, what I'm calling here a uh, refined analysis map model. Sometimes also is the term a you know 3D finite element analysis. Although all of these models would be considered to be a finite element analysis, but in a uh, refined analysis model, the uh, individual girder flanges uh, and cross strain members are modeled with individual lines or individual beam elements, which are shown on red in this figure. So the top flanges of each girder will be modeled with a line of beam elements and the bottom flanges of each girder will be modeled with another line of beam elements and the cross frames will be modeled with their own beam elements. Uh, those are shown in red here. Uh, then typically the girder webs are modeled with a mesh of shell elements, uh, which are shown in orange in the figure. This uh, refined analysis. Uh, there's some advantages here. Uh, it's considered to be more accurate than grillage modeling uh, by modeling the uh, each girder cross section uh, with uh, multiple elements. Uh, one really useful thing about this is the flange lateral bending moments are uh, directly uh, calculated. They're going to be the transverse bending moments in the uh, elements used to model each flange. Uh, and they're output in the same screen in Midas Civil along with the major axis moments and shears. So it's a little easier to work with in a post-processing uh, environment. Also, if there are like stress concentrations in individual flanges in your supports, those can be directly reported from the individual flange forces. And uh, from what we've seen, at least, uh, the cross-train forces from these models tend to be lower uh, for versus uh, using a simpler modeling method. Uh, there are some disadvantages, though, with using this more uh, um, detailed type of modeling. The snow getting around, the modeling is more complex than for a grillage model, so it does take more time. And if uh, you need to make revisions to the model, those uh, revisions can take longer if you need to move cross-train locations, for example. Uh, working with web stress results to determine shear ratings uh, can be a little more difficult than just using straightforward shear forces. And these models, just having more elements, tend to have a longer runtime versus the uh, simpler grillage model. Of, the, uh, of these four types of models, uh, the most detailed uh, that you'll typically encounter is uh, what I'm calling here a detailed refined analysis model, where uh, in a detailed refined analysis model, the girder flanges are modeled with a mesh of shell elements along with the web. Uh, so instead of using a single line of beam elements for each flange, they're modeled with a um, mesh of shell elements. Cross frames are still modeled with beam elements, and the webs are still modeled with shell elements. But and for the, it's where the flanges, we're substituting a mesh of uh, shell elements for the flanges in place of just a line of single beam elements for each flange. So this is the most detailed type of modeling. Uh, it does have some advantages. It's considered uh, to be the most accurate me method. It's used sometimes and might be required for, say, research projects that are doing parametric studies to evaluate you know, code equations, or, for example, for you know, distribution factors, that sort of thing. Uh, but I mean, it does have a lot of disadvantages. This type of modeling is very complex. And uh, the uh, flange and web stress results, since they all come out as uh, stresses and shell elements can be difficult to use to uh, uh, evaluate against code check equations. Then given how it has you know, more elements to model the same structure as any of the uh, three simpler types of modeling, it's, it's going to have the longest runtime of any method. Well, when embarking a, 
on a load rating for a, a skewed steel or a horizontally curved girder bridge, a, a nice starting point to determine, you know, what type of modeling method is most appropriate is the MCHRP Report 725. It was published in 2012, and it provides recommendations for the design and construction of skewed and curved steel girder bridges. Uh, some of these recommendations are for uh, what type of analysis to do. So these uh, recommendations then for analysis are equally applicable uh, to load rating as well as design. And so it will recommend a modeling method to use based on the amount of curvature and skew uh, for a particular bridge. Uh, there's some other modeling considerations uh, that are worth discussing here in this first step uh, about modeling. Um, as for any steel structure, you'll want to calculate uh, stresses that you use in the uh, code check equations to evaluate capacity and compute rating factors uh, using the appropriate non-composite, uh, end or short-term composite, three end or long-term composite sections for each type of corresponding load. Um, also, following ASHTO LRP, uh, girder regions without shear studs should be modeled and analyzed as non-composite sections. Uh, you'll typically find that for older uh, steel girder bridges that didn't have shear studs in the negative moment region. Uh, you, uh, it's particularly important for the, uh, any type of 3D model to define boundary conditions with care, because I think one of the only exclamation points in the whole presentation, and that's because uh, boundary conditions are so important. And uh, if, say, you're about evaluating a horizontal uh, curve bridge uh, with multiple fixed piers, uh, you may want to use a spring stiffness to define those piers uh, to just get what the relative longitudinal fixity is between them. That's one way to do it without having to uh, model the piers themselves in the model. Um, a little more word about uh, boundary conditions. If, say, you're looking at a horizontally curved girder, uh, you'll want to pay careful attention to what the uh, restraints are at each girder line. Uh, MIDAS has a feature, the node local, ac node local access, which at each node that has a boundary will allow you to define the local axis of that node to, if you want, it's up to you to specify the angle, but uh, using the node local axis function allows you to uh, define the local axis of that node to align with the bridge. So you can adjust that uh, node local axis direction to align with the fixed and guided direction of each bearing, which again can be uh, particularly important. Uh, one particular note uh, of caution here is to, uh, in, in, in any 3D model, be very careful uh, to, about restraining rotational degrees of freedom at the support. Only restrain them if you're absolutely sure that the type of bearing or the type of restraint does provide rotational fixity. Uh, something like an integral abutment certainly would, uh, but most other bearing types, it's, it's a lot more questionable whether they do. And uh, if you do provide rotational fixity and there really isn't rotational fixity at a bearing, uh, your, uh, your negative moments will probably be artificially high and thrown off. So just restrain rotational degrees of freedom with caution. And I think that's one of the only other explanation points you'll see in this whole thing that says it's so important. Here's just a, a short modeling example I wanted to share uh, for the load rating of a, a two-span uh, new bridge in, in Minnesota. This is going to be bridge 27W02 that just started construction of it. It's a straight bridge, but it has a 33.7 degree skew. Uh, so when we embarked on the uh, design of this bridge and, and load rating, we, we started with looking at a NCHRP report 725, uh, which had a calculated skew index, uh, which ended up being very close to the actual skew of 0.33. And then going into this table in NCHRP report 725, based on that Q uh, index, we could then see uh, whether what the researchers had found uh, based for bridges of the Q index, whether we'd have uh, accurate or inaccurate results if we use just a traditional 2D grillage model. These letter grades correspond to traditional school letter grades. So, you know, A is good, F is bad. So uh, uh, looking at this, it predicted that, you know, co computation of uh, cross-frame forces and flange lateral bending stresses would get enough to use a uh, traditional 2D grid model. So uh, we uh, followed this advice and uh, went ahead and made a uh, refined analysis model of the structure where we uh, modeled the flanges, the single lines of uh, beam elements and, a, uh, web and uh, the webs with a mesh of shell elements as the uh, recommendation said that uh, the grid model would likely be inaccurate for cross frame forces and planned lateral bending stresses. So we went ahead and did that. Um, you can see across uh, a close up of our uh, model there. So a 3D model, we placed uh, live load using surface lanes and influence surfaces, and uh, we modeled the bridge using MIDAS civil. See here. And um, one 
uh, aspect. Well, one aspect of this uh, refined analysis modeling that's worth noting here is how the uh, cross frames were modeled. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as is typical for refined analysis, we modeled each um, member of the cross frames uh, individually. They're modeled with beam elements. Uh, these beam elements are directly connected to the nodes that uh, are shared by the web shell elements. But we also model the uh, transverse stiffener at each location with beam elements, which then reduces the stress concentration in the um, web shell elements that you get if that uh, transverse stiffener isn't included in the model. It's also particularly important, as we did here, to uh, include the out-of-plane eccentricity of the cross frame elements with respect to the transverse stiffener and the gusset plate. Uh, if you don't do this, uh, you'll get artificially stiff cross frame forces, uh, or artificially stiff cross frames, which will then result in large cross frame forces, larger than is realistic. Um, we use the uh, offset function in MIDAS that you can, you can use with section properties to include that out of plane eccentricity that reduced our cross frame force to 30% in our 3D, uh, in our refined analysis model compared to that if it's not included. And this is in line with uh, the behavior found in the uh, fairly recent Journal of Bridge Engineering paper, Stiffness Behavior of Cross Frames and Steel Bridge Systems, uh, which reflects this issue of uh, cross frames and uh, 3D models of steel girder bridges showing an artificially high, artificially high forces from artificially high stiffness. I uh, recommend everyone to go, uh, go ahead and download that, that paper. There's a lot of really useful information in there and that you'll want to include in any uh, grillage or um, refined analysis model that you make of a cross frame. So uh, we did that for 27W02. And just for kicks, we also compared the results we got to uh, the results we get at the same bridge with a simpler uh, grillage model. And even with these, uh, this out-of-plane eccentricity included in the cross frames for both the refined analysis model we actually used for rating and the more simpler grillage model we made just for fun for comparison, we found that in the cross frames, the maximum strength one forces were 28% larger for tension elements in the grillage model and 52% larger for compression elements in the grillage model uh, versus uh, using a refined analysis. And that was without the seventh degree of freedom for warping torsion activating the grillage model. When we did activate that seventh degree of freedom, and these are pretty preliminary results, but we found that the cross train forces were even larger in the grid grillage model than they were without that seventh degree of freedom uh, activated. So uh, it, it really showed that using that more refined analysis uh, method for uh, design and rating was worthwhile for this uh, type of structure. We also saw that the flange lateral bending stresses calculated uh, using an approximate method in the uh, astro LRP specifications would have been unconservative with respect to what the refined analysis showed they actually were. But given the one third rule and the specifications for those flange lateral bending stresses are divided by three, the impact on rating would have been slight. However, a uh, more highly skewed bridge or a horizontally curved structure, that, that impact could have been larger. So our conclusion here was we were glad we made that more, we followed the uh, NCHRP report 725 guidelines and made the uh, refined analysis model because that um, it's uh, recommendations that the uh, cross frame forces would not be very accurate but proved to be true along with the flames lateral bending forces and it gave us lower cross frame forces as well by using that refined analysis method. So uh, just a little example there. So uh, that's uh, that, that, that does it for the modeling aspects of these bridges. So the next step in the process is to compute demand capacity ratios. Um, most of these bridges are all uh, horizontally curved structures. So you'll be using the ASTO LRC non-compact flexural resistance um, formulas, which are in terms of stress. So uh, if you're using a grillage model, that uh, stress can just simply be calculated as this MC over I, as you'll get a moment output for the whole girder cross section, uh, which uh, you know, typically, you'll, you know, you'll have these three separate models for non-composite, n-composite, and three n-composite loads, but you just, uh, you know, calculate the stress using MC over I uh, for each, from each of those models and sum them together for the top flange and the bottom flange. Uh, well, for a refined analysis model, since you're modeling the uh, individual flanges with individual lines of beam elements, you can find what that uh, in-plane bending stress is from taking the axial force and the flange element and just dividing it by the area of the flange for each of the different models. Uh, in terms of the flange lateral bending stress, there are some approximations out there that you can use to obtain an approximate flange lateral bending stress. We found these are pretty conservative on the whole uh, based on the, uh, the torsional force reported. Uh, but for refined analysis, 
you can uh, you can get that flange lateral bending stress directly by taking the out of plane bending moment in the individual flange element and just using this MC over I uh, for that uh, individual flange or the out of plane moment to get your uh, flange lateral bending stress. And then you can use these stress results to uh, go ahead and do code checks using a spreadsheet. Uh, that, so that's for flexure. Uh, in terms of getting shear results, uh, the yeah, Ashdell RFD shear resistance equations are uh, written in terms of source. If you're doing a refined analysis, you'll be dealing with uh, stresses in your web shell elements. Uh, you can uh, look at these uh, resistances in Ashdell RFD in terms of stress pretty easily just by defining the uh, shear resistance by the web area to convert uh, those shear resistance equations from a force to a stress. Uh, to then compare against your uh, web shell element stresses. Uh, just to note this again, you'll if you're evaluating the shear capacity using a refined analysis, just be sure to model the transverse stiffeners where your cross frame frame your, where your cross frames connect to the web shell elements with beam elements. These are just the vertical beam elements right here uh, to avoid stress concentrations in the web shell elements that can cause unrealistically low shear ratings if those transverse stiffeners are not included in the model. So uh, once you uh, once you have the model, you have your demand capacity ratios. You can sort them from uh, largest to smallest, and look at a few different uh, types of loads to then select uh, a typical load vehicles to select points of interest. Uh, typically, we find no surprise the regions with pot maximum positive and negative moment, and sometimes the plate size transitions will typically control for the flanges. Uh, often for curved girder structures, uh, the cross frame you seen will often control the rating. Uh, these are considered, again, to be primary members for horizontally curved structures. And the table in ASHTO LRC 6.6.2.1-1 uh, designates what primary and secondary members are. Um, whatever owner you're working for, the load rated structure will likely, in your scope of work, say what they want load rated as well. But that table provides a handy uh, designation of what's considered a primary member. Now, typically, the, cro uh, the cross frames and the straight skewed bridge would not be primary members, but Perhaps the owner will want them load rated anyway. But that's uh, lots of points of interest, just as you would really for any other structure. Uh, then comes to the step of extracting the influence lines. Uh, these can either be influence surfaces working with a 3D bridge, or another technique is you can uh, model sort of dummy lane lines in, in a 3D structure and pull out influence lines for those. We want to compare those results to get what you get for the more technically correct influence surface to make sure they're. Uh, really the same, but uh, either the surface or the um, e extracting the line from the dummy lane element um, works uh, for this process. You want to remember that uh, for um, bottom flanges, typically uh, you'll need to extract the influence lines for both the normal stress and the flange lateral bending stress uh, for flexural limit states. So those influence lines will be different. Uh, this is an example for uh, the influence lines for a uh, bottom flange. Uh, Flexure at mid span and uh, bottom and, and, and the uh, flange lateral bending stress and bottom figure at the same location. So you'll need to pull out the influence lines at the same location for both uh, in plane effects and the flange lateral bending stress effects. Then you have all you need uh, to compute rating factors. You can find the capacity uh, using the capacity calculated uh, with your code check spreadsheet you're presumably doing this work with. You want to include your resistance factor for an LRFD design and the appropriate. Uh, system and condition factors from uh, the manual for bridge evaluation. Uh, then your permanent loads, those will come out of uh, the model you've already made uh, together with the appropriate load factors. Uh, typically, again, you know, for a horizontally curved bridge, we're working in terms of stress uh, to um, be in line with the capacity as the capacity is a, term, is a stress for LRFR. And uh, so we'll want to see that stress add. Don't, uh, we'll need to add the uh, flange lateral bending stress. Uh, to the in-plane bending stress as well. And then our line load demands uh, can be determined by influence lines for each point of interest, uh, and we'll also need to include the contribution of flange lateral bending stress divided by three to the in-plane bending stress. So uh, one thing to note here is uh, as we determine our rating factors, and whichever of these four types of 3D analysis you're using, they're all considered a refined analysis by the Manual for Bridge Evaluation. Uh, so you'll just want to be sure to follow the section to increase uh, where when you're doing permanent evaluations to increase the permanent rating factor by 0 0.1 uh, and uh, for routine permits and to follow the instructions that it specifies for refined analysis, which you can apply to all 3D analysis 
uh, for special permits as well, because it does make it cause a change to uh, the load factors to use a refined analysis versus a 2D analysis. Uh, so now uh, we'll talk about, uh, Frank's going to talk about uh, other great interesting challenges using uh, unbraced sections, and I'll um, hand the control over to Frank. Thanks, Daniel. All right, folks are able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you clear, clearly. Okay. So I'm going to continue along the lines of what Daniel was talking about, um, but getting into some topics that are maybe a little bit more unusual uh, with respect to girder bridges, and then take a little bit of a detour and talk about some unique uh, problems where we've used Midas and some more complex bridges, in particular um, looking at a steel arch. There we go. So the first uh, the first topic is going to be what I call the rating of unbraced floor systems. So it, it's actually fairly common if you go back and look at some older girder bridges, but certainly also in bridges like arches and trusses, where we had floor systems. So what Daniel was just talking to you about uh, was a series of parallel I-beams, right, plate girder I-beams with cross frames in between them. And, uh, you know, each one of the girders picked up a fraction of the load. An older form of construction is more widely spaced main girders. And then instead of cross frames, you used to see things like is shown in the photo here, either a rolled shape or a plate girder diaphragm, and then supporting some smaller stringers. And the, the way that the system, of course, works is that the, the slab spans a relatively short distance between the stringers. They span between floor beams. The floor beams load the main girders. The main girders carry the load. So you'll see this kind of framing system again in older girder bridges, though it's, it's coming back again. It's making a bit of a comeback in some modern structures. But you also see it in trusses and arches. Um, what's characteristic, though, of almost all of these structures is that if we look for the presence of bracing for the stringers, we don't see any, right? The stringers themselves don't have diaphragms or cross frames in between them. They span, you could say, unbraced between the floor beams. However, they are obviously braced at their top flange because they're connected to a concrete slab. Uh, but this, this becomes a dilemma more in the sense of how do we apply the specifications then really is there a problem when we think about the behavior of the structure. So just to kind of put everybody on the same page, here's a, a bending moment diagram, say for a three-span beam. And it happens to be one of the, the small stringers that you just saw on the prior slide. And it's the dead load bending diagram. So realize that, of course, dead loads aren't the only forces. There could be positive bending moments. There could be negative bending moments because of the moving nature of the live load. But this just gives us some perspective that there's a variation in the bending moments, of course, that exist along the span. We know that the effect of that moment uh, diagram and the moments being non-uniform is, is actually beneficial in the sense that the most critical thing we could ever uh, ask of a beam is for it to be subjected to a constant moment within an unbraced length, because that means that the stresses in the flange, for instance, are constant everywhere. Uh, that's the, the biggest problem with respect to buckling. So this is a sketch that comes out of the specifications. You'll see things like this in Ashdo. You'll see similar uh, sketches in AISC's modern steel construction. And it basically says that if we have a flexural resistance of a section subjected to constant stress, then depending on the unbraced length L or, or lambda, if we want to look at some other slenderness parameter, that we can express the bending resistance or the axial resistance, either in terms of moment or stress, by the solid line. So there's a certain relationship between slenderness and capacity. Uh, however, if those stresses or those bending moments are not uniform within the unbraced length, then we effectively get a larger strength because only one particular spot is subjected to the peak stress, and the stresses vary uh, otherwise throughout the unbraced length. Uh, 
And it's what we call the C sub B factor. It's a moment gradient modifier uh, that provides us effectively a larger strength of the section. So the challenge of rating the kinds of stringers that you saw on the prior slide is, how do we deal with the fact that we have to define an ungraced length? And again, an engineer will be tempted to look for the presence of diaphragms or cross frames. And of course, they're not going to see any in most of the kinds of bridges that use stringers spanning between diaphragms or cross frames, the stringers are effectively unbraced. Sometimes they don't even have braces where they cross over the floor beams. So how do you define the unbraced length? And how do you deal with this issue of the moment gradient and the moment gradient modifier? So in the Hohen Bridge project, which is a project that, that Michael Baker did for Wisconsin Department of Transportation oh, about five years ago or so now, we were asked to provide a load rating for a bridge that had that stringer, uh, diaphragm, main girder, cross section. In fact, the photo you saw is from the project I'm talking about, as is this moment diagram. So these are all um, real things that we had to deal with on a project. Uh, the owner, again, was Wisconsin Department of Transportation, and they said they would like the bridge load rated not only using the AASHTO standard specifications, but also LRFT. So, to sort of put in perspective some of the dilemmas or some of the challenges that a load rater is going to face. You take this kind of a moment diagram and you go into the standard specifications, you compute this moment gradient modifier called C sub B, and the standard specs uses an equation that predicts that C sub B factor is 1.75. So there's one result. In the LRFD specifications, we go ahead and take the exact same moment diagram again and uh, because the LRFD specifications take a different approach to the calculation of the C sub B value, we of course wind up with a C sub B factor equal to one, which is unusual, of course, right? Compared to the fact that a different version of the AASHTO specifications tells us the answer is 1.75. Let's see how somebody else approaches it. So if we say, what if this was a building design problem? What does AISC's Manual for Steel Construction say about all this. Well, AISC's Manual for Steel Construction says the C sub, A, C sub B factor is 1.55. So, you know, now you pretty much have a menu. Uh, any book that you open, you can find a different result that certainly doesn't provide confidence to the load rater, to the engineer about what's going on. Uh, the, the truth is that none of those are really the appropriate way of dealing with it. Uh, because what that C sub B factor um, presumes essentially is that you have a section in which both of the flanges are unbraced. In other words, it's a beam spanning through air across some defined unbraced length, which brings us to an approach that Joe Yor and Todd Helwig at University of Texas came up with a number of years ago uh, for treating the buckling behavior of, of a beam in which the top flange is laterally restrained. It can't move laterally and that there are discrete torsional braces. So that's analogous to the photo that I showed you a few slides ago. You have a stringer that's in contact, either composite or non-composite, but in contact with the top flange that can provide the appropriate lateral bracing. And then we have torsional bracing at the supports. In other words, the top flange is braced by the slab and the bottom flange is braced because the stringer is connected to the top flange of the floor beam. And they've come up with an approach that's referenced in the uh, LRFD specifications and the commentary, and that you'll also find in AISC's Manual for Steel Construction as well, that says, for this scenario, in which I have negative moments at the end, I have some positive moments at the center line, and I have this uh, restraint of displacement and twist all along the top flange, we can come up with a different expression for the C sub B factor, and this is really the way to do it. And it says the C sub B factor is given by this equation, which very interestingly, or very beneficially, gives us a result of five, as opposed to values from say one to 1.75, because what it acknowledges is that it's not a beam spanning in air between points of support, in which now we're just trying to capture the effect of the moment gradient, but we're capturing the effect of the moment gradient in the section in which one of the flanges is completely restrained from displacing. So what are some of the implications? Well, going back and again, looking at one of the real problems we were examining uh, 
Uh, we had W30 by 108 stringers that span 37 feet uh, between the floor beams. If you go and look in the standard specifications, which again is one of the things the owner asked us to do, you find an equation for the resisting moment. And that resisting moment, if we plug in all the numbers that were appropriate to our problem, says that the resistance is 390 foot tips times whatever C sub B is equal to. Well, if you very conservatively use a C sub B equal to 1, or a 1 like the Ashto LRFD specifications would suggest, you get a rating factor of 0.32, and you come to a conclusion that, well, there's something significant uh, about this load rating, and the bridge needs to be load posted, or we have to strengthen, or we have to do something else. When in reality, the problem is fundamentally that the calculation is just incorrect. So if we go back and use the work of your and Helwig and come up with a C sub B of five, we see that the rating factor is significantly greater than one. So this is just one of these uh, bring to your attention kind of things. We very frequently get involved in having to load rate structures that look like this. And what's currently in the specifications in terms of a treatment of C sub B really isn't going to give you the right kind of answer. Uh, let's look at another element that's analogous to the type of bridge we're talking about and does lean a little bit on some of the things Daniel was mentioning to you as well, and that's the rating of connections. So here's a cross-section of the same bridge that I was just talking to you about earlier. You can see that we have stringers that sit on top of floor beams um, or, or diaphragms, whatever we want to call them, the diaphragm span between the main girders, the main girders span between supports. We call this a girder floor beam stringer bridge. In a model, and I've drawn some dots and lines here to maybe think about a grid model. In, in a grid model, we have to have complete moment shear and torsion transfer at all of these nodes, right? If we think about it as a, as a waffle or say the grid of a, of a suspended ceiling with ceiling tiles, we have a series of longitudinal elements, a series of transverse elements, and the stiffness of those members and the connectivity of that system is how the load gets distributed. So you can imagine if we apply some vehicle loads to the stringers, the stringers push down on these transverse members. These transverse members are going to transmit, um, are going to have end moments or what turns into torsion, of course, in the main girders. And it requires fundamentally for connectivity that we have a full moment connection between the floor beam and the main girder. Now, in the old days, uh, the engineers, of course, just said, well, I'm going to design these as simply supported. And they're going to assign some distribution factor to the main girders and decide to either include or not include end moment in the connections. It was just how engineers did things manually. Uh, now, when we decide to put this into a piece of software, the piece of software, of course, isn't as intelligent as the person who once made the decision. So the piece of software only knows that you've assigned a certain stiffness and connectivity, and it's going to generate some fairly substantial end moments. But since we were relying on this model for load distribution, we had to reconcile whether we could handle the forces or not. So if you look at the nature of one of these connections, again, the floor beam and a bracket coming in, what you see is a single row of vertical bolts. And we know that a single row of vertical bolts is probably more than adequate for shear but the question is, can we handle moment? Well, of course we can, uh, but how much? So the approach we took as engineers was to say, okay, we understand that a certain amount of moment is going to be generated in the grid. And if we look at the behavior of this bolt pattern as a, as a series of uh, shears and moments, essentially like an eccentric load, then we can use an instantaneous center approach to proportion the loads in the individual bolts and knowing what an individual bulk can carry, we can essentially back out a capacity. So we can look at a, at a series of um, different shears. You can see on the sketch on the right there, or the left, the, the right or the left, really. There's a certain load P, and there's a certain load X, and there's a certain eccentricity. So that results into a shear in a moment. And you can hypothesize different combinations of P and E to effectively generate a, an interaction diagram of safe loads and unsafe loads on the connection. And that's exactly what we did here. So what you see on the screen are uh, our attempt to load rate those connections and show that they could reliably be part of our load distribution mechanism. So we have permissible shears plotted on the vertical axis, um, permissible moments plotted on the horizontal axis, and then you'll see a whole bunch of X's in there. And the X's were real load cases that came out of our model. 
and the difference in the two curves being uh, what if we just left the existing A325 bolts in the connection and hypothetically what if we had to swap out all the bolts for A490s in order to make it work. You'll see there's one data point there that's in between the 325 and the 490 curves and what we concluded about that data point is because we were working with envelope forces that the shear and the moment that we plotted were actually from two different load cases, that they were not concurrent forces, it wasn't anything we had to worry about. So in the end, the conclusion was uh, that we could use the grid model as a way of providing what we considered to be the, the best load distribution in the structure, uh, and we were able to follow those forces all the way through the connections and make sure that the entire load path worked. Uh, Another element of that project um, was, was a little bit more challenging, and uh, there's actually some good news at the end of the line here, so just hang in with me for a few slides. This is the evaluation of the arch. So the, the main span of the Hohen Bridge is a, a three-span tied arch. So you're looking at the tiger there that's in blue, the, the arch rib that's in yellow, uh, crosses the entrance to the Port of Milwaukee. The rib is, uh, is a box section and so is the tie. Uh, the rib has webs that are 60 inches tall and an inch and a quarter thick and the flange is very, uh, they're 48 inches wide, constantly varying thickness from an inch and a quarter to three. And you can see the tie girder, of course, has the same width. It's, it's 48 inches wide uh, with flanges from an inch and a quarter to four inches, uh, but it's an incredibly tall tie girder. It's 168 inches tall, which is 14 feet and the web is only five eighths of an inch thick, and it's longitudinally stiff in top and bottom. If you go into the current version of the LRFD specifications, uh, you'll find some very brief discussion of uh, arch rib design and evaluation. And it's really effectively a carryover from work that was done by Federal Highway Administration by Nettleton back in the 1960s and 70s to come up with some ASD design criteria. So they took some allowable stress design criteria uh, in, in which they simply said there are limits on web slenderness and there are limits on, uh, well, this is the web slenderness. And you'll see they have some maximum D over T's of 60 and 90, depending on whether you do or don't have longitudinal stiffeners. So recall that I said that our web was uh, 168 inches tall and only had a 5 eighths inch thickness. So there's no way that we can even use the specifications to load rate this element. Yet it's obviously carrying load, right? So we have to come up with some strategy to perform a load rating. Notice in all of these equations, there's something about D over T is a function of the square root of FA. So FA is an axial stress in the arch rib. Um, a few observations. Notice that there's only an axial stress component. And the question, of course, is what about bending? Uh, unfortunately, or at least it's worth knowing that when they derived these allowable stresses that they presumed there was a certain amount of bending in the derivation, they assumed that the bending was 1.75 times the axial stress. Well, um, is that true for all problems? Of course not. Sometimes there's more bending, sometimes there's less. Um, but it's one size fits all in terms of these equations, right? Unfortunately, this is an unnecessary constraint uh, since the axial force and the bending moment can vary significantly for different arch types and for different points of interest even in the same structure. So just hypothetically, you can imagine there could be all sorts of different stress distributions, right, where the stress at the top of the web of the rib is different than the stress at the bottom of the web. And we know that from a buckling perspective, they all have different K factors. If they all have different K factors, they all have different theoretical buckling strengths. Right? So we know how to handle this problem uh, unfortunately, ASHTO has very strict rules on what you are supposed to meet or not meet. Flange slenderness is a similar problem. The flanges have um, slenderness limits that says B over T must be less than or equal to. They give us some limits and then they tell you the maximum B over T is 47. Uh, however, if you use their expressions and you're out at the maximum flange slenderness, you have uh, limiting stresses of less than 15 KSI. So it's a very punitive requirement in general on flange slenderness. We know other ways of treating plates. For instance, going back to, to Timoshenko's work, we can 
find a very um, classic equation that says the stress, the compression stress, again, is equal to some K factor. Think back to those sketches I showed you of stress gradients. Uh, if I knew the gradient of stress in the lead or I knew the gradient of stress in the flange, I could compute the critical buckling stress. I wouldn't have to go back to these assumed ratios of bending and axial stress and force myself through Ashto's equations. Uh, there are some other approaches. What if we, we didn't want to limit ourselves to just elastic behavior, uh, but also wanted to consider the inelastic behavior of plates, which is particularly uh, the kind of mode of behavior that happens when we get into stockier plates, right? where we consider that not only do we have uh, the, the full width of the plate, but that it's not all um, uniformly effective, right? that we wind up with some effective width approach. And this isn't anything new. We find this in the specifications all over the place. Um, Ashto already talks about effective width approaches for things like columns, uh, non-composite uh, box-shaped members, the, the bottom flange of, uh, of steel tub girders, right, where you generally have a very wide plate subjected to compression. Ashto talks in many places about the use of an effective width and even gives us an equation. So we, we looked at all of these possible expressions as ways around the dilemma of having plates that were physically outside the limits of what Ashto said we were allowed to have for things called ribs, whether it's webs or flanges. Uh, this kind of puts in perspective the problem with the Ashto equations. The Ashto equations for arch ribs are, is the blue line all the way at the bottom, the very dark blue line. So it's the lowest of all curves. And it basically just shows you an allowable stress versus B over T. Up at the top, you'll see a, a red line and a green line. Those are the same predicted capacities if we just called it some other kind of thing in compression. So for instance, if we use those B effective expressions that I talked about earlier, we get the green line, which gives us a very high capacity relative to if we just call it a rib. So if we change the name of the element, we can more than double the capacity. Uh, again, if we look at that red curve, that shows you what happens if it was the bottom flange of a, of a box girder. So we knew that there were significant enhancements in strength. We just had to um, essentially intentionally violate the specifications. We had to ignore all these provisions on our ribs and come up with our own design criteria for the structure the rib. Uh, the tie girder was similar problems, right? We had a 14-foot tall plate that's only 5 eighths inch thick uh, with asymmetric flanges that were 48 inches wide and varied anywhere from an inch and a half to three and a half inches thick. Uh, all the same fundamental problems though, right? Uh, slenderness capacity, uh, slenderness issues, capacity issues, very slender webs, slender flanges, and uh, once again, no real robust provisions for flexural and axial capacity of boxes, even in LRFD, and what you can find conflicts with each other internally in the specifications. Uh, lots of the same kinds of problems all over again, right? It's a tiger, which means it has a lot of tension in it, uh, but there is a substantial amount of bending in this tiger, which means in some cases, the tiger is purely in tension. In other cases, we get flexural stress distributions uh, which begin to look more like the stress distributions you see in an eye girder web than a member that's truly in tension. So uh, we wound up in, in many ways falling back on some of the eye girder provisions that said uh, we can predict the allowable compression stress in an eye girder web using equations in the specifications like the ones that are shown on the screen here. FCRW equals 0.9 times Z times K and divide by D over TW squared. That's the classic bend buckling resistance of a web. And uh, we can compute K based on the relative location of the neutral axis. So K reflects the depth of the web in compression and the total depth of the section. So I can very easily take the tension force and the bending stress distribution in that eye girder web and figure out what the, the, the net stress on the section is, figure out the depth of the web in compression I can get K, K can give me the allowable stress, and we can essentially backdoor our way around all of these issues of provisions not being appropriate for the design of the tie. But you can see that there was an awful lot of work spent trying to essentially create a design approach.
this all came to a head, uh, uh, of course, you know, in this project, and I'll talk about that in just another slide. Uh, tiger flame slenderness, nothing really new here, right? The same fundamental problems as we had with the rib, uh, both the flanges in the web and the tiger or web. And that is that the code was simply uh, much too conservative. We end up using these same effective width concepts. And, uh, but by going to this sort of slenderness approach, this plate slenderness approach, it allowed us to rigorously treat axial forces and in-plane bending and out-of-plane bending uh, because in the end, they all just result in some stress gradient, whether it's a stress gradient in the web or the stress gradient in the flange. Uh, but going through all this work of essentially creating a design approach um, did result in a bridge that had adequate load rating and it was successfully rehabilitated and continues to be operational today. The good news of all of that is um, the work that we did on the Hohen Bridge, which, by the way, was all analyzed using MIDAS as well. The, the work that we did on that project and, and the work that some others uh, were, were undertaking at the same time all prompted Federal Highway Administration and ASHTO to take up the effort uh, to create a new specification for non-composite steel boxes. So FHWA funded a task order called Proposed LRFD Specifications for Non-Composite Boxes. Uh, that task order is being run by HDR. A lot of the analytical work, really the bulk of the analytical work is being done at Georgia Tech. Uh, Cowie is involved, Mike Grubb from M.A. Grubb and & Associates, and, and myself on behalf of Michael Baker, uh, all working on developing uh, new language for the specifications that will handle unstiffened, so we're talking about non-composite boxes, in other words, a, just a four-sided steel section, like you see in arches and trusses and straddle vents for pier caps, right? all of those types of structures. And the new provisions are going to be able to handle unstiffened sections, longitudinally stiffened, longitudinally and transversely, and then the, the whole soup to nuts of forces, compression, tension, biaxial bending, shear torsion, as I said, the, the kitchen sink. Uh, this week on Wednesday, uh, we're actually having a one-day meeting in Washington, D.C., where we're sitting down with the ASHTO committee to go over their final comments, uh, talk to them about the provisions. Uh, I expect at this point uh, that that's going to continue to move through the ballot process, and uh, these provisions will be in front of ASHTO, subcommittee T14 on steel structures for, for vote and their approval in June, and then move forward to the committee of the hall for approval at the Committee of Bridges and Structures meeting uh, in Alabama, which will be held, uh, which will be held next summer in June. So, in fairly short order, you know, by the end of next year or so, uh, middle to the end of next year, I'd expect that Ashto will have approved provisions to be able to not have engineers have to create design specifications on the fly anymore. But there will actually be some rigorous uh, language uh, along with all of that specification development. By the way, are going to be a series of design examples. So at this point, we already have three. Uh, we have a truss member, uh, we have an arch rib, and we have a tiger uh, showing how the specification provisions are to be applied. And uh, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. That actually brings us to the end of, of all three presentations. Although you've heard Daniel and I speak, uh, it's certain uh, that all of these people and more uh, had significant input into all of the various projects that we used as case studies. Uh, so what you saw over the course of, of three webinars is really a whole series of real projects uh, from the Michael Baker archives, all of which were based on us using Midas uh, in one way, shape or form to do the analysis and help us solve problems for owners. Uh, again, all of these engineers and more were involved in those projects. Uh, Daniel and I just had the the opportunity to come before you and speak to you about these projects. So uh, again, that that concludes our presentation. I uh, hope I guess I'll turn it back over to you and uh, yes. you can take control. I guess go ahead and take control back and do whatever you need to do in terms of questions and answers. Sure. So, uh, can you can you now see my screen?
I can. Daniel, can you see it as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we have about three questions uh, today. Okay. How, how many questions? Um, three three questions, but actually more questions. Oh, three. Okay. More question is actually uh, coming right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> they yeah. They, so, we should, so we should hang up quickly. Uh, that's what you're telling us. Yeah. Yeah, you can. You can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you can answer to these three questions for now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let me see here. Uh, the first question for the refined analysis model: What is your recommendation uh, for the dash for the deck um, mesh size? Uh, I, I would say that that probably comes, that kind of comes out of the uh, mesh size for the girders, like on the in, in the general for the the web shell elements. You want want those shell elements to be, you know, probably as close to squares as you can really practically get them. So then, so then you sort of decide, well, how uh, how many vertically wedged shell elements do you need? Well, you need enough that you can get the get there to be nodes. For the cross trains coming in, and uh, to then you know have those nodes at the right place, and to still have square elements, so then that gives you a uh, longitudinal uh, spacing to just just get that size, which then uh, to line those up with the uh, deck shell elements, then gives you sort of a, a longitudinal spacing of the shell elements. Since uh, you're not using the stress results from the deck themselves uh, to do the design of the deck. Those deck shell elements can be, be more rectangular, I would say. So I, I don't want to give a specific recommendation, but again, it's based on the, the mesh size that you would need for the girders in the refined analysis. And then you probably want to do a mesh refinement study to see, like, at what point are you getting the same uh, the same forces in the girder, re regardless of how refined your uh, deck mesh is. Because again, you can get rid, you can get away with uh, deck shell elements that have a more rectangular aspect ratio. There certainly the uh, more more rectangular you keep it, the fewer of them you have, and the quicker your runtime will be. But you don't want it to be so coarse that your uh, live load results are inaccurate. Uh, and then the uh, the second question was, what was the reason to run a load rating for a new bridge? Uh, this as the owner, Mindad, and I'm, I'm sure most other owners want a, uh, a load rating on file uh, for their new bridge, so they, they know what the load rating is, that they, they can report it uh, as, as federal highway as they need to, and they know what the uh, permit vehicle re ratings are. So, you know, any new bridge we design uh, here in Minnesota, we would also need to provide a load rating for. Um, uh, Frank, I think the third question is for you. Okay, uh, let me let me just chime in on question number one as well, Daniel, uh, with regard to the mesh size of the deck. So Daniel was talking about one strategy of doing the finite element model where he's actually meshing the web with shells as well. So that winds up driving the geometry of a fairly fine mesh size everywhere, really, because that starts to, to demonstrate what the node spacing is going to look like down the length of the girder. If you're going to use something more traditional, like, a, say, a platelet-centric beam model, right, where we're going to just use beam elements to mesh the structure in the longitudinal direction that we're not going to have, uh, so you're, you're inevitably not going to have very fine spacing of the longitudinal nodes, you know, with regard to how many deck elements you need between the girders, you know, the truth is um, two or three nodes in between the girders is plenty good. And, you know, you don't want to have really goofy aspect ratios on your shell elements. So, you know, aspect ratios of like two to one to maybe three to one max are sort of uh, fairly conventional. So, uh, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. It also depends on the kind of structure. Uh, nothing really to add to, to question number two, other than most owners now as part of new bridge design need a load rating on file in their load rating system so that they can begin to process the structure from there. Uh, question number three, combining the two topics on the agenda, their particular challenges with rating an unbraced arch rib structure. So, uh, are there particular challenges to rating an unbraced arch rib structure? And, and I would say yes, and that is that um, the load rating there has to be capable of handling global stability and amplification of forces due to imperfections that are going to happen both in plane and out of plane. In other words, you um, it, it becomes very difficult to sort of fake your way into some sort of an effective length analysis of an arch rib in which there's no bracing in any plane. Uh, 
Right now, the, the good news is that there aren't a tremendous number of those kinds of arches out there, but there are some. And people generally tend to do them now for aesthetic reasons, right? So you wind up with a, a through arch and you're driving down the deck and the arch is on either side of you, but there's no bracing above your head. So what you have to be uh, aware of this course is you truly have to do um, a geometric nonlinear analysis in order to figure out what the capacity of that structure is. And you have to seed some initial imperfections into the arch, both in the vertical direction and in the lateral direction, um, so that the geometry has a place to begin to amplify from. So that's really the challenge. It's not so much in the capacity of the members. It's not so much in the calculation of the members' capacity, but it's on the demand side and making sure that you truly understand the instability possibilities of that kind of bridge. Well, Frank, if I may chime in at the end of three here, uh, yeah, we we could have a whole uh, we could have a whole webinar just on the topic of rating an unbraced arch road structure. We we've done a few of them, and I, I'd recommend the if you're doing one, the uh, direct analysis method, also known as the advanced analysis method, specified in uh, the AISC uh, uh, field specifications, is a a good starting place because it Correct. lays out specific requirements for the geometric nonlinear stability analysis you need to do. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Frank and Daniel, uh, do you mind to answer two two additional questions, or do you? Uh, go. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you can answer to the num uh, question number four and five. I. Yeah. Can you Can you see? My screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what is your solution on concurrent forces from the output not available in minus corresponding axial forces at the maximum bending case? Uh, so uh, what we've been able to do is, um, Daniel, correct me, it's the it's like a load tracer feature in minus, right? Where we have, oh, wow. the, we have the ability to identify uh, a particular load case that contributed to say, Let's say that the question is you're concerned about load rating something in which axial load and bending moment are both a component of the load rating equation, right? So yep. we're, we're doing a, a column that's subjected to bending and axial load. Now, if, if you were to do that load rating based purely on the envelope results, um, that will almost inevitably be a conservative result. I can't imagine a case in which it would not be a conservative result. Uh, but it also may be punitive in the sense that you get a rating that you can't live with. So what you really have to be able to do is go back and trace the load case that produced the maximum axial load and find the concurrent bending forces manually, and then conversely, trace back to the load case that produced the maximum bending and find the concurrent axial load, right? They have to be from uh, the same statics load case. They can't be envelope forces because they don't exist together. Hmm. And, and to add to that, Frank, um, my, my just, the, the moving load tracer is a really nice function that Frank laid out to see uh, what what loading is producing each force and will allow you to define the static case that then gives you concurrent load. But uh, my, my just does have that functionality as well. In the uh, moving load analysis control, you can check a box uh, for concurrent force output. And then when you display the uh, uh, results table, you can right click and then get access uh, forces that are concurrent for one particular load effect to be maximized. Uh, in our load rating, uh, load ratings, that is that is what we tend to do. We just put the uh, concurrent, you know, forces that are concurrent for axial force, maximum minimum forces that are concurrent for maximum moment in plane and out of plane, and then just look at all those cases. So it right. might itself have that functionality. And let me see, in question five here, do you use Midas Civil's load rating feature? Um, personally, I tend to, I, I, I tend to use uh, the co-check spreadsheet, our co-check spreadsheets we've developed in-house for determination of capacity. We just like to do that ourselves, but, but those load rating features are there. Yeah, I'll, I'll I guess, reinforce the point. Um, it's, we see it as our obligation as the engineer uh, to take responsibility for the code checking uh, so that it's not that uh, the software can or can't do. It's just been the policy of our company that this is how we do things. And the, the other thing that, of course, is true is that uh, 
uh, so many departments of transportation have exceptions and changes in policy of way that they like to do things or don't do things and different load factors or different resistance factors or different limitations on behavior. They're all a little bit different, right? So although there's one AASHTO, there's really 50 and it's all the individual DOTs. So we find that uh, we can just deal with those nuances and our clients' preferences a little better on the side. And uh, we tend to use software, Midas and otherwise, uh, just to provide sort of the analysis, uh, but we feel it's our obligation to do the engineering. Okay, yep, sounds great. So yeah, um, thank you, Frank and Daniel, for the presentation and oh, and for your answer to um, to the questions, engineers' questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I believe everyone also enjoyed the webinar by getting some insight of load rating project and learning how right. Midas Civil can be applied to their uh, steel composite uh, bridge or or yes, yeah, steel complex bridge projects. Well, um, sadly, uh, today was the last session of the complex load rating webinar series. So uh, now we have to say bye to uh, Frank and Daniel. Well, yep. Thanks a lot, Hope, for having us. We appreciate the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks, Hope. Time. Yeah, thank you, Frank and Daniel. <laughs> I, I, okay. I appreciate it so, uh, so much. Um, so, yeah. yeah, if you have any further questions about uh, software capabilities or want to learn more about the software that Frank and Daniel use, which is Mighty Civil, then uh, please let me know more. And, yep, uh, this is the end of the webinar today. Uh, once again, thank you <laughs> so much for uh, Frank, Frank and Daniel for, uh, for the presentation. And uh, thank, you, thank you all for uh, coming today. Have a wonderful day.